The motor car is the most versatile form of transport we have. It has added a new dimension to our geography and to our lives. The motor industry too is versatile and provides an astonishing variety of cars. But despite this variety, the engines of nearly all of them work to the same basic principles. This car is typical of many. So let us take the engine out of it and find out how it works. This is a four-cylinder gasoline engine of orthodox design. Parts of it have been cut away so that we can see inside it. The engine can be turned by hand. By pushing down and letting the forearm swing with the crank, we turn vertical movement into rotary motion. This is essentially what the engine does. To see how, we need to look inside it. In a four-cylinder engine, there are four pistons moving up and down in separate cylinders, outer and inner pistons moving in pairs. Each piston is connected by a rod to a cranked shaft that runs the length of the engine beneath. Remove the body of the engine altogether and we can study the component parts. First, the piston. There are sprung rings set in grooves on the outside to give it a tight fit in the cylinder. Inside, there's a metal pin called the gudgeon pin to hold the connecting rod. The connecting rod is the arm that swings to convert the linear movement of the piston into the rotary motion of the crankshaft. The crankshaft is forged from a single piece of metal and is the main rotary component of the engine. The connecting rods are fitted to it by the big end bearings. These are the principal moving parts of the engine working together. Four pistons moving four connecting rods to turn four cranks on a single crankshaft. In the engine itself, each piston moves inside a closed cylinder. The crankshaft turns in its crankcase, supported by five bearings. The crankshaft turns a flywheel, and it is from here that the power of the engine is transmitted to the wheels. It also acts as a gear wheel for the starter motor. And so the engine is rounded at the bottom to accommodate rotary motion, and rectangular at the top, to allow for vertical movement. But movement requires a force to produce it. A force applied to each piston in turn. A force like this. In most car engines, we get it from gasoline. Gasoline is volatile and vaporizes quickly. In contact with air, the vapor burns readily. If we pump a mixture of gasoline and air into a glass cylinder and ignite it with a spark, we can see how the flame expands as the gases are burned. This expansion of burning gases creates pressure. If we compress the mixture before we ignite it, the pressure will be much greater.
In the engine itself, combustion must be made to happen automatically. It is timed to occur on every fourth stroke of the piston. There are two valves set in the cylinder head. The inlet valve allows the piston to suck in the mixture before combustion. And the exhaust valve releases the burnt gases after it. They both close to allow for compression and combustion. But before the inlet valve opens, other things must happen. Gasoline must be pumped up from the tank and air drawn in through a large drum-shaped filter into the carburetor. Inside the carburetor, the gasoline is metered into the airstream through a jet. Then the mixture is vaporized in the inlet manifold, a branched pipe which distributes it to the cylinders. A second manifold carries away the exhaust gases. Inside the cylinder, the inlet valve opens and the piston sucks in the vapor. The valve closes, the piston rises, and the charge is compressed and ignited. The exhaust valve now opens and the gases are expelled. So we have four movements of the piston to each combustion. The induction stroke, the compression stroke, the ignition or power stroke, and the exhaust stroke. A four stroke cycle. Induction, compression, power, exhaust. Combustion requires ignition, so a dynamo supplies current to a coil and distributor. In the distributor, a rotating arm makes contact in turn with each of four terminals, one for each cylinder. From each terminal, a lead carries the current to a sparking plug, which screws into the cylinder head. At the end of the plug, there is a gap, which the current has to jump, making the spark which ignites the mixture. The contacts and leads are arranged in the firing order of the cylinders, which in this case is one, two, four, This gives a firing order of outer cylinder, inner cylinder, outer cylinder, inner cylinder, to even out the thrust on the crankshaft. At any given moment, each of the four pistons is on a different stroke. When number one is firing, Number two is next to fire, and so it's on the compression stroke. Number four is on the induction stroke, and number three, having fired last, is on the exhaust stroke. In the same way, when number two is firing, number four will be on the compression stroke, number three will be on the induction stroke, and number one, having just fired, will now be on the exhaust stroke. As number four fires, the permutation continues. To 
enable all this to happen, there has to be a mechanism that will open and close all the valves in the engine in the correct sequence and timing. This timing device is the camshaft. There are eight cams, one for each valve, set at varying angles on the shaft. Anything positioned on a cam will rise and fall as the cam comes round. The camshaft is driven from the crankshaft by a chain set to ensure correct timing. The cams lift push rods and these in turn operate rockers set on top of the cylinder heads. Here is the camshaft on the engine itself, lifting the push rods which in turn operate the rocker arms. The rockers pivot above the cylinder head, opening the valves by pushing their stems down while powerful springs close them again. And so the camshaft times the opening and closing of every valve in the engine relative to the four-stroke cycle. A gear on the camshaft drives the distributor and the oil pump that circulates lubricant to all the moving parts of the engine. The dynamo is belt driven from the crankshaft. The same belt drives the cooling fan and a pump that circulates cooling water from the radiator through jacketing around the cylinders. The four-stroke engine charges itself with a mixture of air and gasoline, compresses it and ignites it. Accelerate the cycle and the engine develops power. Thus, by the linkage of pistons, connecting rods and crankshaft, rotary power is produced at the flywheel of the engine. When the flywheel turns at several thousand revolutions a minute, enough power can be transmitted to the driving wheels to give us the range of performance we take for granted in the modern motor car. There are any number of variants of the basic engine. It may have six cylinders instead of four, giving us an engine that's both bigger and smoother running. The cylinders are not always arranged in a single block. This engine has only two cylinders set on either side of a central crankcase. Both pistons turn a single crank. The same principle of having two pistons to one crank is used in some of the biggest and most powerful engines in the world, the American V8s. The cylinders are in two banks of four to form a V. The breathing of an engine can be improved by fitting two or more carburetors, giving a better distribution of mixture to the cylinders. Breathing can also be improved if the inlet and exhaust valves are operated by separate overhead camshafts, with the cams opening the valves directly. They can open the valves quicker and hold them open longer. This engine uses a fuel injection system instead of a carburetor, delivering the gasoline directly into the manifold. The engine may be mounted at the back of the car instead of at the front. It may be inclined instead of upright. It may be mounted across the frame and drive the front wheels instead of the back. 
But in each and every one of them, combustion releases energy that can take us round the corner or across a continent.